foolish mistake that she had made was misunderstood and carried away. Daddy, don't look at me with an unnerving glance. Daddy, please give me a child learning to stand. And I need you to hold my hand. Don't close the door on me. Give me a chance. sweetheart but over the years they drifted apart she cared for the kids he pursued his career and they seldom talked because neither would hear till he called her one day said he wanted to leave in desperation she begged don't give up on me and don't close the door on me give me a chance be all that you want and more if you don't close the door I'll be all that you want and more if you don't close the door God where are you when I need your help if I can't find you how can I find myself I'm lost and alone Closed out by life's doors, but he says that the ones that have been closed are yours. I am right here, I always have been, but up until now, you wouldn't let me in. Now don't close the door on me, give me a chance to be, I'll be all that you want and more, if you don't close the door. Be all that you want and more if you don't close the door. Don't close the door on me. Give me a chance to be. I'll be all that you want and more if you don't close the door. I'm sure you've heard that if you, uh, if you, if you can't remember how to spell the word friend, you just know that the last three letters, you know, are E-N-D. So a friend is a friend to the end. I really hate those kind of things that they do. Assume is the worst one, right? I mean, they call you an ugly name if you make assumptions, yet we live in a world where most of our decisions are made with incomplete information, Right? And so they say, well, every time you assume, blah, blah, blah. And I go, what? You insult me because I make decisions on incomplete information? That's what we do. That's what humans are all about is making. So I really loathe those kind of little word games. So um, I always remind them that the first three letters in funeral are fun. <laughs> and if you take the R out of friend, you've got a lot of fiends. So... Uh, Today we're going to talk about the friendship between Peter in chapter 16 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus. So there's some dispute as to when Peter and Jesus met. Some people believe that Jesus just walked up to a fishing boat one day and said, come follow me, and and Peter said, okay. Um, (laughs) Others feel like that maybe Peter... And Andrew had some knowledge of Jesus, maybe had traveled with Jesus down to one of the feasts or festivals before his ministry began, had some concept of him. Keep in mind, the geography of the place is such that uh, up where Peter lived, which uh, a lot of people say he was a fisherman in Bethsaida, but his home, we think, was in Capernaum, because that's where his mother-in-law was healed. And like Dr. Kim, people lived with their mothers-in-law back then. And so Peter and the gang and his brothers kind of probably lived in Capernaum. And it's interesting, if you study the scripture of the New Testament, try to put it in order. It really looks like Jesus' Galilean ministry was centered around Capernaum. 
If you remember, they always say we're going to go over the lake, and they go over to Decapolis, which is now the, the Gaza Strip. But if, if you say, I'm going to, we're going to go over the lake, that's over from Capernaum. So the Capernaum side of the lake is where he always was, and probably he was staying at Peter's house. His home was where? In Nazareth, right? We know that he didn't call his disciples from Nazareth because one of them said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Which is not something you'd say in Nazareth, is it? Like, uh, you know, Texas is a bunch of hicks, right? You wouldn't say that in Texas. You'd say Oklahoma is a bunch of hicks in Texas. <laughs> and, of course, you could get away with that in Texas because it's true. But anyway, um, <laughs> okay, it's not true. It's not true. I know it's not all totally true. But anyway, um, so, so Jesus probably stayed at Peter's house most of the time. In fact, there's a good argument that not only was the healing of, uh, obviously, Peter's mother-in-law there, but also, probably, there was that incident with the roof being lifted off and the paralytic guy being lowered down probably also happened at Peter's house, which we hope was insured because the roof was kind of torn up from that. But anyway, so long about the middle of the ministry, it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Amen? And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Okay, so you know why speakers always narrow it down to three points, right? Because there's no possibility you can remember more than three. So you're going to need a pencil today, because I winnowed and I winnowed and I couldn't get to three. So if you want to take a pencil, the very first relationship message that we get from the friendship between Peter and Jesus is that friends, and Christian friends especially, good friends affirm one another. Now, I don't have very many friends to whom I could say, well, you're the anointed one of the Son of the Holy God. I, I can't say that to very many people, uh, one only, but there are a lot of affirmations just like Jesus that says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, good on you. That's what they say in Australia, isn't it? Good on you. We say here, good for you. I don't know what you say in Latin America, but you say something, right? And, and that kind of affirmation is important. We need to affirm each other. There's a quote that says, if you are not being affirmed in your relationships, you are being hurt. It's true, isn't it? Your friendships, your relationships need to build you up. That's where we get built up so that we can go out and reach others. So point number one is that relationships are for affirmation. There's a story of a teacher back in the 1960s, and I think she might have worked at a Roman Catholic school because she said that she had taped Mark's mouth shut. Now, I never saw that done in school. I may have deserved it, but I never saw it done in school. But in the 60s, you could do things like that, right? So she had taped Mark's mouth shut. He grew up a little bit, and she had him in junior high. And one day at the end of a Friday afternoon, things were kind of getting... Uh, teachers, you know what they get Friday afternoon. People get a little restless, right? So she decided to do a little exercise in her junior high class, and she asked every child to take a piece of paper and write the best thing that they could think of about the other children in the class, each of them. And they all did that, and she took up the papers, and then she rewrote those things and so that each student had a collection of what every other student in the class thought of them, the best thing they could think of them. Well, years later, Mark was killed in Vietnam. And after the funeral, most of his classmates and the teacher had met for a meal at his father's house. And Mark's father took the wallet out of his pocket and he said, they found this on Mark when he was killed. And he removed a folded, refolded, and taped piece of paper. 
the one on which the teacher had listed Mark's classmates and what they'd said about him. Charlie, another student who was there, smiled and pulled out his list. Someone else said, I keep my list in my desk drawer. Chuck's wife said, Chuck put his in our wedding album. Marilyn said, I have mine too, it's in my diary. And Vicki reached into her pocketbook and brought out her frazzled list. Affirmations are absolutely key to relationships, especially marital relationships. We need to remember to say the good that we think. And we need to remember to think the good that we should say. People need affirmation, and Jesus modeled it for us in his relationship with Peter, and so should we also do. Soon thereafter, in verse 21, exactly, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples what must go to that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great, undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke. What is that word in English? We don't use rebuke much, do we? Scold, right? Scold him. He shook his, he wagged his finger, right? We call that finger wagging. Is that what you call it? Finger wagging? He wagged his finger and he said, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, in his kindest terms, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So if you're writing down with your pencil, relationships can handle conflict. Relationships can permit, handle, understand, appreciate, and grow from conflict. You know, there are a lot of people I know who are divorced, but I know a lot of people have been married for a very long time. If you want to take advice from somebody who's been married a long time, there are people in this church who have been married a lot longer than my 27 and a half years. But if you want to check with somebody, just ask somebody that's been married a long time. Can you be married without conflict? And the answer is no, you can't. You cannot join your life with somebody else but there's going to be some bumps and scrapes. And real relationships, Christian relationships, can handle it. Christian relationships are okay that there is conflict. There's, I don't know how many of you know Richard Foster. He wrote a book called The Celebration of Discipline. It's a tremendous Christian classic. He also wrote another book called Prayer and several others. And he used to hold these seminars, I think he still does, he called them renovare, it's Latin for I have no idea what. And, and these seminars that he would hold were really cool. We went to one one time. It's two days of just singing scripture songs, praying, and saying great things about our creator. And it, it isn't like a lot of sermonizing, it was just it was just a really pleasant kind of an experience where we all glorify God together. So Richard Foster does this. He's on the road doing this all the time. I think he's a Quaker or a Mennonite or something like that. And uh, he, he was a great man, and his, he is a great man. And his son, his son went through a period of kind of being anti-church. And in his book he says he was living what's call, what he called a ragged attempt at discipleship. He was afraid to share his honest thoughts about God and his disillusionment with the church, especially with a father who'd given his life to serve God in the church. But one day, as Nathan shared a ride with his dad on a ski lift, he blurted out, I hate going to church. It's nothing against God. I just don't see the point. And Richard Foster responded quietly, sadly, many churches today are simply organized ways of keeping people from God. Surprised by his dad's response, Nathan launched into a well-rehearsed cynical rant about the church. Okay, so since Jesus paid such great attention to the poor and disenfranchised, why isn't the church the world's epicenter for racial, social, and economic justice? I've found more grace and love in worn-out folks at the local bar than those at the pew. And instead of allowing our pastors to be real human beings with real problems, we prefer some sort of overworked rock stars. His dad smiled and said, Good questions, Nate. Overworked rock stars, that's real funny. 
you've obviously put some thought into this. Nathan was surprised that his rant didn't phase his dad. He didn't blow me off or put me down, he said. And from that point, Nathan actually looked forward to conversations with his dad. It proved to be a turning point in his spiritual life. And by the end of the winter, he was willing to admit that he decided that if, quote, I'm not willing to be an agent of change in the church, my critique is a waste. Regardless of how it's defined, I was learning that the church was simply a collection of broken people, recklessly loved by God. Jesus said that he came for the sick, not the healthy. And certainly our church reflects that. And so he made a difference in his life because the relationship was open to conflict. Is your relationship open to conflict? Or is it, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to entertain thinking about that. I don't want to be involved with that. Sometimes we exclude conflict to the detriment of the relationship. It makes the relationship smaller. It makes the relationship weaker instead of the stronger that we're really looking for. So it says in Matthew 26, verse 31, on the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter declared, even if everyone deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So I found the vow. I don't know if any of you remember this. It says, I take you to be my lawful wedded wife, to have and hold from this day forward, for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and health, to love and cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. Now, I don't know what plighting a troth is. But apparently, at some point, somebody did. So they plighted each other their troth. And I, again, is, is the past tense of plight plighted? I don't know. But anyway, they plighted each other their troth. They meant that they were making a vow of loyalty. Now, Peter makes this vow of loyalty toward Jesus. Do you think he meant it? Because, you know, we know what happens, right? He kind of breaks under the pressure. But do you think he meant it? He meant it, didn't he? In fact, he proved it. I can prove it too. Imagine for just a minute, imagine for just a minute that there are four of you in this room that are packing firepower, right? Statistically, it's close, okay? So there are four guys in here that have guns on them. So imagine for just a minute, all three of the back doors come crashing open and an FBI SWAT team comes marching down the aisles. And they grab me and throw me to the ground and start putting handcuffs on. And then imagine that one of the people that's packing stands up and shoots one of the FBI agents. How long does he live? It can be counted in parts of a second, right? The FBI is going to gun him down mercilessly and instantly. And if somebody standing near him gets hurt, that's okay too. They're going to get rid of him. It's exactly what happened to Peter when the temple guard arrives at the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas kisses Jesus. It says they roughly grabbed Jesus and Peter drew his sword. Now, Peter's a fisherman, he's not a sword fighter, he's not a warrior. Peter takes and he marches into the group and he just takes a big swing. He was not looking to cut an ear off. He was looking to cut a head off. And he marched into the fray and he took a swing and instead of cutting a head off, he cut an ear off. Do you think he knew that his death was near? It was suicide. He had to know it was suicide. He also probably knew that the others weren't going to march into that fray. It was him alone. And this was suicide, and he knew it. So Peter absolutely had the loyalty that he expressed to Christ. He was ready to die. Now, Jesus softened the experience. But Peter was loyal and ready to die. Friends, if you're writing your list, friends in relationship are loyal, period. 
there's a story of the uh, fellow that they found, you know, at Pompeii. They fell, found people in all sorts of positions. They found some hiding in basements, some trying to cover up. They found some on roofs because they were trying to get up above the mess. And yet they found one soldier, one guard, standing by a door with his spear still in his hand. He stood there as he died. He did not leave his post. That's loyalty. The question is, are we loyal in our relationships or do we simply make our relationships temporary by our absence of loyalty? So, friends are loyal. And then... Listen to what Jesus said. He said, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. We have a saying in our world about friends giving friends warning. We say, friends don't let friends blank, right? Uh, My daughter's like the one that says, friends don't let friends use comic sans. If you, do, if you do typesetting at all, you know what that's about. If you don't, never mind. Friends don't let friends drunk and drink and drive. Friends don't let friends, uh, you know, skateboard off of roofs, whatever. The point is, uh, friends don't let friends engage in unsafe and risky behavior. In fact, I mean, guys, raise your hand. Do you want your friends to tell you when your fly's open? This is yes, right? You want that. You would really prefer that than for you to come up here to do the expression of gratitude and then, not, and then find out, right? Do you want your friends, ladies, to tell you if you have spinach between your teeth? Well, certainly you do. You'd rather have a friend tell you that than have your boss not tell you that, right? So we want our friends to warn us and give us warnings. And that's exactly what Jesus did for Peter. He said, look, let me give you a warning before you get all hot and heavy about how loyal you are, I'm going to tell you that there are pitfalls in your loyalty. You don't know about them yet, but they're coming. Do we want our friends to tell us? You know, there's an interesting story about Ulysses S. Grant. You know, he was a great general. Really, one of the greatest. Absolutely one of the greatest generals. But he had a real problem with alcohol. He got carried away with alcohol pretty consistently. The reason that he was able to be a great Civil War general is because he had a friend, and when he was elevated as the Civil War began, his friend made a pact with him that he would be honest with him, and he made a pact to his friend that he would not drink, and whenever he started to slip, his friend would come to him. He was his assistant, and he would come to him, and he would get him clean again. And Ulysses Grant was great because of his friend who kept him away from the liquor. We need friends who will keep us away from the liquor. We need friends who will keep us away and warn us when we're going down a path that would lead to destruction. Don't you wish, parents, that you had children who had friends who would lead them away from disaster instead of toward it? In fact, most of us pray for that every day. So the next story is the one of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember the story. He said, I want you people to come with me and pray with me. And they fell asleep. Peter was among them. Friends are not afraid to ask for help when they want help. If you don't have any friends that you're willing to ask for help, you either need to look at yourself or look at your friends. Because there's a problem. Friends are not afraid to ask friends for help and get the support that you need. So, We get to the hard part of the story, and it comes in John chapter 18, and it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. Whenever John says another of the disciples, it's his modest way of saying me. So it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did John. John was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest courtyard with Jesus. Now, they've done a lot of excavation about these courtyards and these, these houses. The high priest, this was going to be Annas' house. And Annas' house, if you think about it, probably wasn't much larger than this room. It would have been longer and narrower up to the street. 
But those houses in those days would have a courtyard in the front. And in poorer neighborhoods, the courtyard would contain the animals. In richer neighborhoods, it would just be a very pretty courtyard. And the courtyard would have a gate. You remember we read about that in Acts, right? They had a gate where they came to and they bashed on the gate. And somebody had to come out the front door across the courtyard to the gate to see. And you remember the little girl saw Peter and she said, oh, it's Peter, and ran back inside without letting him in. Y'all remember that story? No? Well, this courtyard, they've excavated the ones around the temple in Jerusalem, and the average size of these courtyards is about 27 feet. So think about your two-car garage. It's about the size of a two-car garage. See, I had always envisioned this courtyard that Peter's in as being rather more palatial than that. But apparently these houses near the temple mount would have had smallish courtyards from our standards today so think about a place it didn't have a ceiling so it was open to the sky and it was about 20 some feet square about like your two-car garage and here is John it says the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching the gate and she let Peter in the woman asked Peter you're not one of that man's disciples are you no he said I'm not so picture this courtyard it's a smallish courtyard all the servants of the house are there because Jesus has gone in to be examined by Annas so they threw all the servants out so they could have a private conversation so the house servants are out the guards and the uh, and the priests are inside and they're talking to Jesus and while they're talking to Jesus everybody's outside and it says because it was cold the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire they stood around it warming themselves, and Peter stood there warming himself. Now, it's important to note that in the New Testament, the word charcoal fire only occurs twice. It's a very unique word. It means a heap of burning coals. And it said, here is the, they were warming themselves at the heap of burning coals, and inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. And Jesus replied, everybody knows what I teach. Now, you say this, this is not Jesus being kind of modest and saying, well, you know, I don't have time to tell you all that I teach, but, you know, you should ask the other people. This is Jesus not answering the question. This is the judge asking Jesus, stand up and defend yourself, and he says, I don't have to defend myself, you all already know it. He's being kind of short with them. And he says, everybody knows what I teach. I preach regularly in the synagogue and the temple where everybody gathers. I have not spoken in secret. Why would you even ask this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? And Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you need to prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you hitting me? Then Annas bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire warming himself, they asked him again, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, saying, no, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? And again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now picture this scene. Here's Jesus in the house, and the only way out of the house is through the front door and through the gate in the middle of the courtyard that's about as big as your two-car garage. Do you think Jesus is being hustled out past Peter? Do you think he can see Peter there? Do you think Peter can see him? I don't see how you could miss it. So these movies that have Jesus looking Peter in the eye just as the rooster crows may have it pretty close. So Peter denies Jesus three times, and that brings us to a relationship issue that's really important. Christian relationships can even withstand the crudest betrayals. See, we're tempted to throw away relationships when they get really ugly. And thank God that Jesus doesn't. He gave us a model of how we should treat relationships, and it's right here, and even when Peter denied him. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, Peter wasn't really saved until after this. Peter wasn't saved until he was reconciled with Christ because, you know, if you, if you have a relationship with Christ, you can't, you can't turn that on and you can't turn that off again. When was Peter saved? Anybody got any ideas? Just about the time that Jesus said, follow me. And Peter responded and was in relationship with Jesus, an unbroken relationship with Jesus from that time for the rest of his life. Did it waver? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we see it wavering here. But was it broken? No. 
Now, the next part, if you read the New Testament, you read Peter, you see all of his, he's, he talks a lot. He's got a lot of words. All through the New Testament, in the, all the Gospels, you see him doing a lot of stuff and doing a lot of talking. He talks all the time until this scene right here. If you go chronologically from this point here, he gets real quiet. Paul says that Peter is the first person that Jesus appeared to. It turns out that Jesus appeared to the disciples a number of times, and yet we never have Peter saying anything in any of those meetings. Until we get to the one by the seaside. And it's in John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Peter, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is that? That's John again. John said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Can you see the picture? Can you see the picture? John says, that's Jesus over there. And Peter just grabs his coat and jumps. He's not waiting. He doesn't care about the fish. He doesn't care about the fishing. He sees Jesus. He wants to get to Jesus. And so he jumps in the water, and it says it's 200 cubits, whatever that is, but it's a long way off, so he has to swim all the way over there. And then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. There's that other reference in the New Testament to a fire of coals. Fire of coals there and fish laid on it. So so Peter's standing at a fire of coals when he denies Jesus three times. And now he's standing at a fire of coals when Jesus asked for some fish and he cooked some breakfast for them. When he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Peter, son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my ship and sheep. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and walked where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not wish to go. The last lesson about relationships is that we as Christians are here to mend broken relationships. Jesus mended his relationship with Peter. Whose job was it to mend it? It was really Peter's job, wasn't it? Peter's the one that messed up. Peter should have come to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm sorry. But Peter's silent from the time of his betrayal to the time of his reconciliation. He's totally silent, doesn't say a word. Nothing recorded in the New Testament. Was he with Jesus? Yes, he met him, he saw him. Did he say a word? Not that's recorded. And then at the seaside, Jesus mends the relationship that was Peter's job to mend. And Jesus opens Peter's mouth again, and he never closed it again. The whole rest of the New Testament is Peter speaking out violently, viciously, and courageously for Jesus. And being killed for it. So here's the question. How are your relationships and my relationships stacking up to Jesus' model? See, I'm afraid mine aren't too good. I'm afraid I have a tendency to let my relationships slide and not do the things that Jesus modeled for us and that he showed us through his relationship with his disciples. So the question is, the question today is, are we ready, willing, and ready to be made able 
to have God change our hearts so that our relationships will be like his. We have two relationships, right? This one and that one, right? Up and out. And so the question is, are we ready to work on the up and out relationships so that even when it should be their job to mend the relationship, we'll mend it? That we're not afraid to ask for help and we're not afraid to give it when it's asked. That we're the kind of people who can live in a relationship with conflict and we can live in a relationship in which we affirm one another. Are we ready to do that? Jesus gave us a perfect example and the question is, are we ready to follow it or do we just want to keep living like the world lives? Will you let me pray for you, Heavenly Father? We are poor at relationships. We'd get D's if we were in school. We ask right now that you would mend our hearts so that our hearts would mend our relationships. We ask that you would heal us and change us from the inside out. Transfer from us our heart of stone and give us your heart of flesh. Help us to know love, to experience love, and to share love with others. Help us to reconcile our relationships with one another. Give us the courage, the grace, and the wisdom to accept your love and to share it. We know that this is your will, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.